Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this PCR tricuspid webinar. We're going to spend the next hour discussing echocardiographic imaging for transcatheter tricuspid interventions. And to start, I want to introduce myself and my esteemed colleagues and friends. My name is Edmund Ho. I'm the Director of Structural Heart Imaging in the Echo Lab and the Co-Director of the Structural Heart Center at Montefiore Medical Center in New York. I'm joined by Laura Sanchez, who's an interventional imager from the hospital clinic in Barcelona, Spain, as well as Augustine Kwan, who's the head of the cardiac unit and an interventional imager from Lille University Hospital in France. First, let's uh, do the learning objectives. So we're going to really try to go through different uh, aspects of imaging for tricuspid valve intervention. So first, we'll look at patient screening and device selection, and Laura's going to take us through that uh, in some great detail, and we'll have some discussion as well. And then next, Augustine will have a case-based discussion on key working views and some of the advanced 2D and three-dimensional tools that we can use when we're actually guiding uh, interventions. And then lastly, I'll be discussing some of the I guess, fun things to come in the future, including intracardiac echocardiography for tricuspid valve interventions. You've already seen some of our team members here on screen. The one person who I haven't introduced yet is Anna Sanino. She's going to be our chat master. She's joining us from the University of Federico II in Napoli, Italy, and she also serves as the medical director of the core lab at the Heart Hospital in Baylor in the United States. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions that you have. We'll also be paying attention to the chat line. And then if possible, we'll try to address as many of those questions and points of discussion as possible. So to get us started, I'm going to actually hand things over to Laura, who's going to speak first. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. So first, we are going to start with the imaging evaluation of the tricuspid regurgitation and also to know which device is better for its patient. So these are my potential conflict of interest. And first of all, uh, we need to know that now we have so many devices that are uh, already in clinical use, at least in Europe, but we need to differentiate those devices that are for tricuspid valve repair from those devices that uh, are for tricuspid valve replacement. So we will move on along this presentation to know how to select OWA patients uh, to uh, initially to repair and when it's not possible for replacement. Uh, we will see that we can do a step-by-step -step approach to these devices and we will see along the presentation. So first of all, uh, we need to start always with an echocardiography and I will try to present how to do a standardized echo of our patients with a tricuspid regurgitation. First of all, we always need to start with a TTE. It's the first uh, approximation for the tricuspid regurgitation. It's important that we do all the possible views. We will start with the parasternal uh, long axis and short axis view. And then we also need to have uh, the four chamber view just to know how is the TR in all these uh, planes, but also to know how is the uh, size of our atriums of the ventricle and also uh, how is the severity of this uh, TR. It's also important to know what is the function of the right ventricle. Sometimes we will need a, a MRI, but sometimes with the echo, we will have more or less an idea. It's important to remember that uh, from the TTE, we sometimes uh, can have this uh, kind of very nice 3D view of the tricuspid valve, especially for those patients with very large uh, right ventricle or right atria. So just to try to do uh, the 3D, if you have the opportunity with your machine, because sometimes it's even better than with the TOE. And as you can see here, we can flip the 3D to have uh, in the right. I imagine that it's very close to the image that we've done with the TOE. Don't forget to also screen uh, other parameters as the inferior vena cava, since when the patients have a significant TR, it's enlarged. And we can also measure the uh, flow back in the suprahepatic vein. So there is a parameter that from the uh, for the follow-up after the intervention, it's very interesting to see how it changed. So don't miss the inferior vena cava. And of course, just a reminder that now it's not only severe TR, 
we also have a, a new gradient scheme with severe massive and torrential. And this is also important uh, when we are trying to know if the patient has a problem of pulmonary hypertension that have uh, more weight than the TR, because if we have a severe TR, we can rely in the Doppler spectrum to more or less know if the patient has pulmonary hypertension or not. But in patients with massive or torrential TR with this kind of triangular Doppler, uh, it's important that if you have doubts, you need to do a right heart catheterization to be sure that the patient don't have a proactive uh, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, for the quantification, uh, in the classification, they, they also mentioned the PISA, but I really like the biplane uh, vena contracta because it's really easy to do if you have a 3D probe, you, you just put the image and, the, and you put the biplane and it's easy to do and more, more important, uh, we can have some problem with the PISA because if we measure also the 3D area of the vena contracta of the TR, you can see here that the uh, orifice area is not uh, round as in the mitral. So sometimes the PISA can have some pitfalls and if you have a nice 3D as, we, as I was saying that so many patients have with uh, a significant TR, I think it's a very uh, nice uh, measurement uh, to can grade over patients with tricuspid regurgitation. Just try to do 3D in your patients with the TP. Now we are going to move to the TOE. Always, if we want to know how is the anatomy and to have uh, all the views, we need to do also a TOE, especially if we aim to do a repair of this valve, because we need a fair uh, echocardiographic window to uh, can guide this intervention. So we will always need uh, to do uh, the DOE before to decide the device. And we will start with the zero degrees with a four chamber view. But you can see here in the left that sometimes it's not so great the visualization of the uh, tricuspid valve because we have all the shadowing of the atrium and also the interatrial septum that sometimes have fat or sometimes we also have prosthesis in uh, left position. So if you go a little bit deeper, not missing the esophageal, but before to go in transgastric, uh, the window, it used to be better as you can see in the right in the same patient. So just try always to put a little bit deeper, deeper and you can have better images. But the two most important views in the tricuspid valve will be one, the inflow outflow view. And it's important because uh, as you can see here, we have the aortic valve in the right and then the free wall. So we will have the anterior anteroseptal and posteroseptal side of the valve. And if we put the biplane line over this valve, we can screen all the uh, parts of this valve. So we will be sure how is the coaptation line in the more anterior part, in the middle part, and in the more posterior part of the uh, valve. And as we will see later, it's important just to know uh, how is our gap. We will discuss later regarding how to measure the gap. And the second most important view in the TOE is the transgastric short axis view. We will talk about that later also, because it's the place where you can see nicely the three leaflets and to know what is the morphology of our tricuspid valve. Sometimes uh, you also have a very nice uh, 3D imaging of the, of the valve. If you, yeah, now it's moving, but this is not uh, possible in all the patients. So you need to rely on your transgastric short axis view for the anatomy. Of course, if you have this kind of nice 3D that at least in our hospital we used to put the aorta at five o'clock just to mimic the position of the leaflets in the transgastric short axis view, and you have this kind of 3D, of course, you can also measure here the area of the vena contracta in 3D, and you can also have measurements of the annulus using the NPRs. Then there are other complementary views, but they are not so important that it's a direct view uh, of 150 or 70, that it's the view that you used to obtain when you put the biplane in the inflow outflow. So you already have it if you performed uh, at the beginning the biplane, but just to know if you have shadowing or not. And then uh, the uh, modified back view, it's important sometimes to have a good alienation for the Doppler measurements with the TR. And sometimes it's also a nice place to obtain uh, the 3D because you can exclude the interatrial septum when you put your box there. So with the echocardiography, uh, we can know what is the anatomy of the valve. We need to identify the mechanisms of the TR. What is the gap? If we have leads, what is the interaction with the leaks? And also to evaluate, as I said, the acoustic window if we want to repair the valve. 
So uh, I think uh, Dr. Cohen uh, will discuss regarding this later, but uh, you know there is, that there is a new classification for the morphology of the tricuspid valve. And this valve is not always tricuspid, only the half of the valve are tricuspid, but it's important that you identify what is the morphology because it also has implications in the therapeutic. Because there are some studies that suggest that uh, valves that are not uh, tricuspid, uh, especially the quadricuspid or those ones with a indented uh, septal leaflet, have worse outcomes with the edge-to-edge -edge therapy. So to evaluate uh, this anatomy, I strongly suggest you to have a very nice short axis view of the valve in the transgastric view, because here is the place where you can identify the number of uh, leaflets and where are the commissures. And if you are here in the transgastric short axis view, it's very easy if you do a 3D directly from this view to obtain, if you reduce uh, the gain, to know where is your papillary muscle. You can see here in the right that it's clear where is the papillary muscle, so everything that is in the anterior part of the uh, papillary muscle will be anterior and everything uh, in the posterior part uh, in the free wall will be posterior. So then uh, during the screen, we need to also assess the etiology of the TR. As you will know, the classification is functional. That could be uh, 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 from the atrium or from the ventricle, if we have an enlargement in one of these two cavities. But it could be related with pacemaker and also uh, could be an organic or primary TR. Just some examples. In the uh, left, you have the patient that we were already screening, that it's a functional atrial TR. This used to be the best patients for S2S therapy if the annulus is not very enlarged and the gap is affordable. And then on the right, you have, for example, a traumatic uh, prolapse of the anterior leaflet that in this case is not very high. So sometimes we can also use the S2S therapy. Uh, then, in case that the patient has a pacemaker, you need to carefully look for the interaction with the leaflet. Again, the transgastric short axis view is very important. The one in the left top, you can see here that it's almost a functional TR because you see that the um, lead is just in the uh, posterior septal commissure and have no interaction with the lead, so you can treat it as a functional TR. But the one in the bottom, we have an impeachment of the leaflet, so this is an uh, organic TR that cannot be treated as a functional TR. Other patients, as the one in the right, have a mild interaction, and sometimes we can also treat it more or less as a functional, but they are very difficult for beginners. Uh, another important thing, as I said before, is to measure the gap. You can measure it in two places in the TOE, when it's in the transgastric short axis view, but to do it directly here, you need to be sure that you are in the tip of the leaflet. You can see here that if you put the biplane from your short axis, you can see if you are not in the tip or not of the leaflet. So if you are sure, you can measure the gap and you need to measure the gap not from the leaflet to the commissure, you need to measure the gap among the leaflet, septal anterior, septal posterior, but you can also measure it from the inflow outflow view with biplane. You just put your line in the place where is, uh, the TR is bigger, and uh, you take out the color, and you can measure here what is OA gap, as you can see here in the right. Uh, then, if you have a, a nice 3D, always you can measure it directly with NPR, but as I said, it's not so frequent. And for therapy selection, as I said, T, uh, transthoracic equine T will be the first approach. And with this, we can decide if the patient can undergo edge to edge therapy or not. And uh, the patients with more favorable anatomy will be smaller gaps with an anteroceptal jet location and uh, no interaction with the pacemaker. And of course, uh, having internal in the morphology. I think the second talk, we will go deeper in this. Uh, but sometimes we have this kind of patients, in this case, a four-leaflet leaflet a patient with a big gap, so the edge to edge therapy is not, is not a good option for this patient. In this case, we can run a CT. So with the CT, we can have a nice measurement of the surrounding structures, relation of with the right coronary artery, and uh, to can evaluate for the, their therapies. We still can have a repair if we are doing a percutaneous annuloplasty. You can see here that with the CT, it's easy to measure the annulus. We can also see the relation with the right coronary artery, and uh, we can evaluate if the patient 
could be suitable for cardio band. Uh, for the cardio band, it's necessary to do a good planification. Normally with the softwares as three dimension, you can have this planification, but sometimes the cor right coronary artery, as you can see here in the uh, left, is too close to the annulus. So this is not an option. So what are we doing with our patient? So we, again, we can have two options for functional to try to intensify our uh, diuretic treatment and to see if the gap now is abordable for H2H therapy. But in most of the patients of patients with uh, more advanced disease or organic that cannot go with cardioband because cardioband needs to have an enlarged annulus and functional etiology, uh, you need to move on and use this CT to evaluate other options as the uh, valve. Uh, we have in the market the teratopic uh, valve implantation, that is the trick valve, but it goes in the inferior and superior, val uh, inferior, vena, inferior, and superior vena cava to avoid the, the backflow of the TR. And now, uh, and with the trick valve, uh, at least in Spain, we have more experience with the than from the orthotopic valve. But there are so many orthotopic valves now going on with so many studies, and I think that in the uh, next year we will see a lot of aortic valve being implanted in our hospitals. Uh, depending on the valve, you will need different measurements of the CT. So it's important that you have a, a nice CT with uh, the covers to evaluate if it's possible to do one of these techniques. And based on what you have available in your hospital, uh, you need to decide will, what will be the next step for your patients. So just to finish, some take-home messages. Uh, the echocardiography is the initial technique for tricuspid valve evaluation. We can obtain the mechanisms. Uh, we can know if we have imaging enough, uh, good enough or not for repair. And remember that transgastric short axis view and inflow, outflow, uh, plane with uh, biplane are the most important views. Uh, the echo, it's enough for the S2H therapy. But uh, for the rest of the intervention, we will need a CT for planification. And then when you have all the information based on your patient's characteristic, you need to decide a tailored therapy. Uh, and always, I think that for the moment with the studies that we have, we need to favor the repair in front of the replacement. And this is all from my side. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura. I mean, that was a lot of information to try to make yeah, you cover in a sorry. short period of time. You did a great yeah. job. Um, we have a few minutes for discussion. Uh, so maybe uh, very quickly, I just want to pull up some uh, interesting discussions that have been going on in the chat um, brought to us by uh, Anna Maria uh, Codrino. Uh, some discussion about, you know, annular dilation and when we start thinking about annual plasty. So I'm going to actually pose this question to both of you. So when you're doing uh, the initial echocardiographic evaluation, which tends to come first, what's your approach to actually looking at the annulus and deciding how dilated is this? Is it, you know, worth pursuing uh, annual plasty uh, and going on to looking at that CT? I think it's a very good question because at the beginning we were just seeing the gap and trying to identify the leaflets. But I think the when we have a very enlarged annulus, we may think that maybe this patient also can need a annuloplasty. So at the beginning we were uh, just measuring as for the sargions in the uh, deep uh, TOE for chamber views, just the uh, the side there, the a linear dimension of the annulus. But I think that we need to move forward and start to try to do in measurements with the 3D of this annulus. Because I think that when we integrate our experience with this enlargement of the annulus, we can be we will be able to identify more which patients will benefit from H2S therapy or they will need further therapies because they have a more advanced uh, disease and sometimes they they will need like combine uh, combine approach. So I think I, I will try to measure both uh, the anterior posterior and then the 3D. I don't know in in Lille. Yeah, Augustine, how about you? Oh, we can't hear you. I think you may be yeah. muted. Yeah. Okay, it's better now? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think it's a, a really good point. We need to, to keep in mind that most of TR patients are not only uh, related to a, a pathology of disease of the leaflets. And when we are doing all our screening, we need to keep in mind both the leaflet, but also the tricuspid annulus, the subalveolar apparatus. It's super important to look at everything. 
And what we are doing in daily practice uh, uh, in my center is try to use, of course, mainly TTE for the screening at the beginning in four channel view, but we are moving forward very fast to TE and all the analysis with, uh, with, uh, with the new tools, including 3D tools, because it will allow you to get the perimeter, the area, and, and several diameters. So that's what we are doing in, in daily practice in, in Lib. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for bringing that up. And I'm, I'm looking forward to actually seeing some examples of those tools. I, I mean, I personally, I agree with everything both of you have said. I also do both 2D measurements and I try to do a multiplanar reconstruction view without using the advanced tools. Of course, we're stuck with a bit of a planar measurement, but at least it kind of gives us some idea of the geometry and size of the annulus. Um, and I do have to say, from my point of view, I find it a little challenging because, you know, I know in the past we would use a hard cutoff um, to say it's dilated or not, but you know, there's also this relative dilation to the lethal lengths, which I find can be quite variable um, depending on the patient. Another really great question that has come up uh, in our chat um, from Yuan Primet actually uh, is related to when we're doing the screening evaluation. And both of you have already touched on this a little bit, but maybe very quickly, Laura, um, how, what do you do in terms of picking the time point with someone's volume status? Do you make sure they're extremely dry before you do your imaging? Do you do it in their sort of, you know, usual steady state? Do you want them to be a little overloaded? What do you think is best? Yeah, I think that the best thing is to try to do the screening when the patient has the medication optimized, but uh, just without pushing the patient in an ambulatory setting. So you do the screening, and if you think that the gap is too big and there are no other options for repair for these patients, you can intensify this therapy, even to admit the patient in the hospital and to try to put EB uh, diuretics to try to see if the gap reduce or not. But uh, this is a little bit tricky because uh, sometimes uh, you can have a reduction of the gap and you do H2S therapy, but then if you do H2S therapy, you need to maintain the intensification of the diuretic treatment. Because if the if the valve returns to the normal dimension, you can have a risk of detachment. So it's something that we learn in our learning curve. So if you push a lot the patient and you do H2S therapy, then you need to maintain some time uh, the diuretic uh, with a high dosis just to uh, let the valve to accommodate to the new situation. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, in the interest of time, I actually want to move on to our next uh, case-based discussion with Augustine. Um, Augustine, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, thank you very much, Edwin. Um, so um, I'm going to talk uh, today. I would like to first to, to, to thank the PCR Track Speed Group for the invitation. Uh, we're going to talk about the TE guidance uh, for thrust catheter tracker speed uh, intervention. Um, first, I would like to uh, highlight uh, this publication from the American Society of Echocardiography, led by Becky Ann, regarding the standards uh, for the performance of TE screening uh, for all these uh, structural disease interventions. So I'm not going to talk about the, the screening perfectly done by, by Laura before, but we just need to keep in mind that we have several uh, views available, several tools with our, and several mo uh, movements with our uh, probe, trying to, uh, to reach uh, esophageal or trigastric views, and we need to know perfectly the anatomical uh, structure visualized by all these uh, views, even if sometimes it's not so, so easy and sometimes it's between uh, two views. Uh, I'm going to start with a case presentation of a uh, 80 uh, years old man uh, with a prior history of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, permanent atrial fibrillation, diabetes, and obesity. Uh, you can see pretty well the four chamber view on the right with a severe TR and a, a dilated right ventricle with a good LD function. This patient has been hospitalized several times, not in our center, but uh, in other center for uh, acute heart failure with uh, many uh, right sided symptoms. And uh, we saw him the last time in our center. And among the, 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 the treatment for heart failure, he was already uh, under high levels of diuretics uh, under furosemide 750 twice a day. Uh, we calculated his error score 2 at 4.2 and a tri his try score at 8 uh, over 12, uh, leading to a predicted mortality at uh, 48%. So we discussed about the, the, the patient in our heart team and we decided to propose him uh, transcatheter 
uh, uh, track speed edge to edge repair, and you're gonna see just after uh, the Y. So we started with this uh, mesophagal uh, LV uh, outflow view. You can achieve this view by just putting the track speed valve in the center of the of your window and do a mechanical forward to 60 degrees. It's also called the commercial view, and you have a good uh, evaluation of the width of the of the of the regurgitation, as you can see on the on the right. And what you can do, of course, uh, if you put the the outer as a landmark. You have close to the outer the anterior leaflet and then the posterior leaflet on the left, separated by the anterior leaflet by the anterior papillary muscle. And you can put a biplane view here on the on the right on the anterior leaflet, and you will have on the right the septal and the anterior leaflet. And we moved uh, our line to the posterior leaflet to get on the right the septal and the posterior rather than the septal and the anterior leaflet. And you can see that the um, most of the gap was between the septal and the anterior uh, leaflet of the valve. And on this view, but you can also do it on the uh, deep esophageal view, uh, you, we were able to do a 3D on fast view, the view on the left coming from the right uh, atrium with the aorta at 11 o'clock, and you have on the left the septal leaflet, on the right the anterior leaflet, and below the posterior leaflet. And you can see pretty well also uh, in 2D in 3D and in 3D with and without color and transillumination, the gap the gap between the septal and the anterior leaflet. And what we can do is was perfectly uh, shown by Laura before. You can rotate clockwise uh, your aorta to put the aorta not at 11 o'clock but at 5 o'clock to get exactly the same segmentation as you can have in transverse trig view, meaning the septal leaflet on the right, the anterior leaflet uh, below, and the posterior leaflet on the left. And then, of course, on this view, you can do all this measurement of the evaluation of the tracker speed annulus, the area, the perimeter, several diameters. It's really interesting when you're going to choose the perfect device for your patients. So in this transit review, you're going to try to achieve this uh, transit review by a short axis view. But sometimes, it's pretty hard uh, to see perfectly the commission between the anterior and the septal leaflet. So what you can do is uh, you can try to uh, move from the short axis to the long axis view around 120 degree and biplane this short axis view here at the tip of the leaflet and you will have a perfect short axis view uh, uh, to see perfectly the uh, coaptation gap. And uh, in our patient, uh, as highlighted by uh, Becky Ann, uh, we uh, uh, observed a type wine, uh, a three leaflet device, and our strategy was try to uh, grasp the anterior and the anterior leaflet uh, uh, in the commissure between the anterior and the septal leaflet. So we're gonna try to start by this bicaval view. You have the inferior vena cava on the left and the superior vena cava uh, on the right. And um, we're gonna try to follow, okay, it's working now. We're gonna try to, to follow the device coming, of course, the clip from the inferior vena cava on the left. And then uh, we're gonna try to uh, uh, follow uh, the clip, the device, and try to target uh, the planned uh, area between the anterior and septal leaflet. And of course, we're gonna check with and without color, as you can see. One uh, interesting tool is try to use the MPR to check the orientation before crossing the valve, but also after crossing the valve. It's really useful uh, when you are not perfectly aligned and you want to see perfectly the arm of the clip, but also the leaflet and to check uh, the orientation of your clip. And then we moved uh, to the, uh, the transverse view and you can do some, uh, some uh, movement clockwise or contact clockwise. Try to be perfectly aligned in the commissure and in our patient, uh, in the transverse view on the left, we were too, uh, in this, too far from the commissure, we were uh, in the center of the valve and we tried to push, push a little bit the device to be perfectly in the commissure and to have enough room to put a second clip if needed. So we did a, a grasping and we're gonna see just uh, the grasping afterward and we were pretty happy with the first grasping uh, of, uh, of the first clip. But as expected, we had a significant residual TR uh, 
uh, more in the center of the valve, you can see that there is no uh, uh, significant TR in the enterocytop commissure. Uh, so as expected, we're going to plan to put a second clip. But what was interesting uh, is that we uh, suspected uh, three leaflets with anterior septal and posterior, and probably we unmask a little bit the, the segmentation. But as you can see, we have a septal and anterior leaflet, but probably a P1 and a P2 leaflet too. So uh, we tried to put a second clip at the level of the anterior and septal leaflet, uh, a second clip parallel to the first one, but more at the, in the center of the valve. So we're going to go back to this uh, mid esophageal view, RV uh, outflow inflow view, try to target the area once again with and without color. And you can see the grasping here of the additional clip on the left. In the anterior and septal leaflet more in the center of the valve. And you can check the grasping on the video on, the, on your right. We were pretty happy with, the, with the, this grasping. And we checked the final result in transgastric view on the left 2D and, and uh, with and without 3D and color. And we were really happy with the, the grasping of the leaflet uh, on all these views. So the final result was, as you can see before on the left, after one clip in the, in the middle and after two clips uh, on the right, so with a good reduction of TR severity in our patient. And uh, as you can see, we also had a significant reduction on, on the measurement, on the dilation of the tracker speed annulus, because the tracker speed valve area decreased from 30 to 22, the perimeter decreased to 20 to 17. So it was uh, uh, an impact, he had an impact also on the tracker speed uh, annulus. So all these steps and tools are useful, of course, for trans uh, tracker speed uh, transcatheter edge to edge repair, but also for all TTVI, both the biplane, but also the MPR and the three tools, as you can see here, uh, with this cardioban uh, implantation. And we have several tips and tricks uh, try to enhance our T guidance. Uh, the first one, I will call it the forgotten knob. I, I don't think it's uh, his real name, but to be really, un really honest, um, I didn't use a lot this knob before the moving to the track field of the, of the tracker speed valve because it's a knob you can use to move from the left to the right. Sometimes try to unmask a little bit your tracker speed valve. It's even more the case when you have a thick interatural septum or an aortic or mitral posteris. The second uh, uh, trick is try to use, of course, the MPR. It's really interesting when you, when you have, like on the left, a patient with an off-axis clip. It's impossible to see perfectly the arm of the clip only using biplane, and you will need to use this uh, 3D analysis with the MPR, and you are able to follow perfectly the alignment of your clip. And on the right, you can see you can also use this dual crop tool, try to see the valve from the right atrium, but also from the right ventricle. And it could be useful also to guide your implantation. And of course, this MPR can be used also with echo CT fusion. And I think uh, Edwin is going to speak about it uh, just uh, afterward. And finally, uh, if you want to, to enhance your guidance and, of course, the grasping, you can try to mine a little bit the gap, as proposed by the team from your house later. Uh, you can try to facilitate your grasping and your guiding by tilting a little bit the table, uh, by 10 degrees, uh, raising the, the, the head of the patient. And as you can see, they observed a significant decrease of both the gap size and the gap area around 25%. So it's really significant, and we are trying to use it as much as we can in, in, in our practice. So in conclusion, I do believe that uh, high quality TE is mandatory for tracker speed here and for every TTVI. We have several tools and skills available and useful and we need to use it like the biplane or the NPR, the right left knob, all the transgastric view and of course try to modify a little bit the position of the patient. Uh, I think we need to work on a dedicated workflow training and validation uh, and recognition for all these TE guidance. And of course, if we have good 
uh, TE guidance, we will improve TTVR results and also communication uh, within the CAT lab. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks, Augustine. That was a great case, beautiful images, and amazing result. Um, so congratulations on that, first of all. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start with a quick uh, question, a point of discussion for both of you. Um, you know, a lot of times interventional imaging for these tricuspid edged edge can be quite challenging um, for because of some of the factors that I think were already discussed. Do you have any tips or tricks for people watching this in terms of how do you check for insertion? Because that ends up being, you know, one of the biggest points where we just really want to make sure that those leaflets are well inserted. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point. Sorry, Laura, you can start, Laura. My pleasure. No, 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 start, start. Just... So, no, I, I've been impolite. Let's go. <laughs> okay, no, no, I just w want to say that uh, it's nice to use all the tips that, that just were uh, reminded in this presentation, but sometimes you, you also need to think in TT during the intervention, because especially for septal, for those patients sometimes with a prothetic valve in the uh, left side that you have so many shadow, so many shadowing in the septal leaflet, sometimes with the TT that used to be nice in these patients with very large uh, right cavities, it used to be also a good tool just to see the insertion of the septal. Something that, that sometimes you are trying and you are, you are struggling and you just do the TT and you have it. So just to remind that it's an option in the cath lab also. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think we, we all agree that the septal leaflet is the most challenging leaflet because it's sometimes the, the shortest one, the most restricted and with the most of shadowing uh, coming from the septal part. Uh, what we are trying to do is try to be perfectly aligned with the NPR to check the grasping. But sometimes uh, when you are perfectly aligned with biplane, you don't need to use NPR because the frame rate with NPR is a little bit lower and you, you won't gain a lot and you will see better the leaflet and better the arm only with biplane. So we are starting with uh, transphagal views, of course, but we're going to check also the grasping uh, in transgastric view, and we are trying to do both when we have any doubt of the of the concerning the the grasping. Yeah, I think the the transgastric view it's it's key because if you see the leaflets going in and out of the clip arms there, you can be sure that you have a lot of tissue there. So I always like to have the transgastric, but sometimes it's a problem. So you need to to get all you you can gain with other views. Yeah, I completely agree. It's always nice to see that short access view when you can tell that the leaflets are going towards the center of the device before you close, um, just gives some degree of confidence. Uh, and then to your point, Laura, I think you bring up a really good point with remembering that TT is an option. Um, and the other view that I don't use too often, but it's a nice sometimes trick up your sleeve that I find can help is that very deep transgastric view that gives you almost like a transthoracic, slightly, you know, apical like view, uh, which sometimes can can really get around that that type of shadowing. Um, and then Augustine, maybe uh, last question for you. Um, you talked a little bit about, you know, using the MPRs and I agree with you, you know, there's always a spatial and temporal resolution compromise when you're using live 3D versus biplane. Um, do you ever use tools like, you know, there are things like biplane prepare, um, like how do you actually set up your biplane to know that you're really, really on axis, both parallel to the septal leaflet and also with your device? Yeah, I mean, it's really tricky sometimes to be perfectly sure. Uh, we are trying to make all the, the planification just before because sometimes it's, easier before the when you are coming with a device you have a lot of shadowing and sometimes it's harder so we're going to try to 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 uh, remember the 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 views and the angulation uh, things like that and we're going to try to confirm by transgastric of course uh, but sometimes it's really hard to be perfectly sure and to 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 have a dedicated for workflow for that um one of the things that could change a lot of things uh, regarding the 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 grasping of the leaflet to confirm everything would be, I do believe, the, the, the four DIs, but I think you're going to speak about about it just uh, just later. 
Yeah, for sure. I think that there's definitely a lot uh, to look forward to in the future. Um, and actually, you know, we have a, a quick minute. Maybe I'll ask one last question. Maybe, uh, Laura, uh, if you can comment. Um, one of the, the views that sometimes, uh, you know, people describe as being very helpful is that lower esophageal window to get around the left-sided shadowing. Is that something you use often? And, and sort of what sort of tips and tricks do you have with that? Yeah, I, I use it a lot, I think, in, in, in almost all the patients because you have a, a great imaging from there that you don't have in the standard uh, view. The only thing that you need to know is that in this deeper view, you mainly see the septal and the other leaflet. It will be not the anterior. It used to be the posterior. It depends on the on the dip. But it's just to try to see in which part of the sofa you have the better imaging for your patient. And this is the second spot that it's great to obtain the 3D this deep uh, zero degrees uh, echo. So I think uh, you need to, to do both always as part of your screening. Yeah, no, very good point. Um, yeah. And then that's the so nice transition to the next piece. Uh, Augustine already mentioned a little bit about ice. There's a question in the chat from Anna Dio Giovanni as well about ice. So why don't we move on to the last presentation? We'll talk a little bit about uh, avenues for the future. Okay, so let's spend a couple of minutes just discussing some future directions in interventional imaging. Um, and I think this will be a nice uh, segue to some good discussion and, and potentially other questions as well. Um, so quick outline of what we'll talk about, a little bit about some new transducers. So we'll talk about 40 ice, mini TE, and then a little bit about uh, fusion systems, which Augustine already alluded to earlier, and then a little bit of like my wish list and maybe uh, where things should go in the future that I hope. Um, so we saw a lot of uh, great T imaging um, from my two colleagues already, uh, but as discussed, there can be significant challenges because of shadowing, esophageal position, um, far field imaging for the tricuspid valve. And I think that's where this excitement about ICE has, has come about because ICE has some advantages. Obviously, you're imaging from the right atrium directly, so you're much closer to the valve itself, and then you usually have a direct line of sight so you can avoid some of that shadowing. And then why 4D is so much more exciting than 2D, which has been around for a long time. With 2D ice, certainly it's possible to see the tricuspid valve well, but our imaging plane is a little bit restricted by the catheter. So you have one imaging plane that you can manipulate really by changing the catheter position, rotation, and then flexion in different axes. But the nice about 4D ice is because now we have a matrix array, we can also do a lot with the actual imaging plane itself, just like we're used to uh, with the TE probe. So we can either rotate the imaging plane around using that omniplane angle, in addition to all those catheter movements. And then once we've found an actual angle that we like for the imaging plane, we can also shift that imaging plane in a parallel fashion um, to that angle using either V planes or uh, the elevation uh, component of biplane as opposed to uh, the tilt component. And then there's different systems available. So in the United States, for example, there are three systems that are commercial now. This is one example, um, which I'll show some images from, which is a Nuvera system that's linked with the, the GE Vivid uh, imaging. There's also options from both Siemens and Philips as well that have been giving us a lot of great uh, imaging during tricuspid interventions. So, of course, uh, as we mentioned, there are some advantages to ice being so close to the valve without shadowing. So we see biplane imaging on the left and then 3D imaging from the ice catheter on the right. And you can really see these really beautiful images of the leaflets that sometimes are just not possible uh, with the T in the mid-esophageal position. And you can see the details of everything uh, here and you can really see uh, in, in, uh, during an intervention, as we'll see in the next slides, what that leaflet insertion looks like. We can also see our volume rates are, are excellent with really good rendering and the image on the right is actually taken during an edge-to-edge -edge repair procedure with the yellow mark showing actually the device of our uh, our first device in that anteroceptal near the commissure um, and again we can really see the position and the effect it has on the leaflets at that point. Some of the tools that Augustine already mentioned uh, in terms of 3D manipulation are definitely available with 4D ice as well, which is a really great advantage. So here is live multiplanar reconstruction, in this case with Flexi Slice. And then here you can see that 
you know, in addition to that 3D volume, we can really be very uh, customizable with our imaging planes. So we can see exactly our device arms, leaflet insertion, we can still see a great short axis view and still understand our AP positioning all at the same time. And actually with reasonable image quality to the point where we can be still pretty confident about leaflet insertion. Some of the other uh, fun tools that we have that are, are very helpful, especially with in-lab communication, are things like markers. So instead of you know, constantly be reminding all of our colleagues in the room that you know, I have the antral septal commissure at 12 o'clock, we can also place markers. And then within those markers, we can already see on all the planes exactly what we're looking at uh, in each view. And then here we also see a different type of multiplanar reconstruction layout, which gives us two short axis planes at the endless and leaflet tips, which can be particularly relevant in uh, even non edge to edge procedures where you want to potentially see both axes at the same time. And then these are again, great tools that we have now available with ICE that really help us a lot during procedures. Um, one of the things that you know we discussed briefly is what do you do about your biplane and how do you get those angles because sometimes it can be really tough when you're sort of hunting for the angle that matches with your device arms when you're doing for example an edge to edge repair so we can of course just manually adjust the primary angle and the secondary angle just like we do with TEE but one of the other nice tricks that we can use is use our 3D tools again and so if we can actually do something like biplane prepare sometimes it's very easy to snap back and forth between your biplane imaging, your 3D imaging, and you can really make sure that you're uh, perfectly on axis. And sometimes that can be, again, really, really helpful, especially in cases where it's really tough to image. And then in this particular example, you can see how after we're able to see those arms, we can watch insertion. And then in this case, now the, the device is actually closed and we can see how taut those leaflets are and that they're coming into the device. Uh, next, let's talk a little bit about new uh, TEE technology. So we have new uh, mini TEE probes available and coming to market. Um, so the first one available right now is, again, from GE with this 9VT probe. Uh, I think in the near future, we should see an option coming from Philips as well, which will be great. Uh, I think it's an exciting area for us because these are small probes, but unlike the pediatric probes in the past, we have full capability with 3D, biplane, everything that we're used to with our normal TE. And then the hope is in this situation, maybe it's safer, especially in people with esophageal pathology um, or in smaller uh, individuals where we're worried about anatomy being smaller as well. And then maybe in some situations, we can also reduce the amount of sedation that we need to give. Um, I haven't had the pleasure of using these uh, devices just yet, but here are some really nice pictures that Augustine provided for me uh, when he was using this mini T Pro. And we can really see the capabilities look like they're really on par with what we see with the large probes. Um, so again, maybe this is a great avenue moving forward in the future. And I'm excited to see sort of more evidence and experience to come. Uh, we heard a little bit about fusion from Augustine already, so let's talk a little bit more about that. So what we would consider sort of conventional fusion that we've seen for, for many years already is really T on fluoroscopy, which here you see a, an example of it being used for a tricuspid edge-to-edge -edge repair procedure. And again, it can give us some extra additional information. I have all the overlays off here on the fluoroscopy, but it can be helpful in, in actually bringing in that soft tissue anatomy onto the fluoroscopy screen as well. Um, but one of the things that we're excited to see in the future, maybe it would be ice on fluoro as well as TE on fluoro. And then as Augustine mentioned, maybe the echo and the CT bringing them together. We've already seen a great example from Laura about all the planning that we do with CT. So sometimes it would be nice to be able to correlate that to the live imaging we have during a procedure. And then lastly, I just wanted to bring up a little bit of my wish list, maybe as a good avenue for a, a launch point for discussion. You know, the imaging companies already give us great technologies right now, but I'm always going to ask for more. So, of course, I always want improvements in image quality, especially when it comes to 3D or 4D, volume rates, resolution, especially for NPR imaging, which we use a lot now, and 4D color that will help us with quantification in particular. 
I think the software tools already are great, but they can always have room to improve. So more flexible imaging presets and markers. When I think about my phone and how I can customize everything, it'd be really nice to be able to do that in the imaging systems, of course. And then enhanced workflows. We already saw how much we switch back and forth between 2D, 3D, potentially T and ICE and use fusion. And then that back and forth and how that sort of works on a practical level um, is always a nice area for optimization. And then maybe there's some role of machine learning and AI to optimize some of the things that we have to focus on during procedures. So, you know, we're, at least I find I'm you know, always hunting down a device as it's moving through the heart. Um, and sometimes that's a bit of a distraction away from your image analysis and actually interpretation. So maybe offloading some of that from the imager can be very helpful. View generation, recognition, those markers, some automation there, and even quantification. All of those are potentially, I think, uh, great time savers moving forward. So key learnings, we talked a little bit about new imaging probes and tools, as well as avenues for the future. And then I kind of, I want to open it up at this point, really for discussion um, with our all of our, our colleagues here uh, and anything that maybe comes up in the chat as well. Someone had mentioned, you know, a little bit about ICE. Hopefully we've covered uh, that as well. Augustine, Laura, any thoughts from your end, questions, points of discussion? Yes, I mean, uh... Congratulations, Edwin, for this uh, brilliant uh, talk. Um, I know uh, that you are, have a, a really good experience regarding 4D eyes, uh, even more for tracker speed uh, uh, TTVI. Um, what are, and how are you using this new probe, this new 4D eyes in your daily practice in the cat lab? Are you using only 4D eyes for your guidance? Are you using regular probe? Uh, and switching from 4 eyes when you are not able to see perfectly the leaflets? That's my first question. And my, my second is, how do you think we're going to move in the future between these uh, three probes? Meaning that do you think we're going to use at these three probes at the same, in the same patient during the same procedure at different times? Or do you think we're going to need to select which probe will be useful for this patient and not for this patient? Yeah, so those are really great questions. I'm going to try my best uh, to, to sort of address them in terms of what my thoughts are. Um, in terms of 4D ICE, you know, I think right now there are some barriers um, to its, its general adoption and use. I think one is experience and the other piece, of course, is cost because they are single-use catheters. So I think that that's that's just reality that I think we all have to deal with. Um, I've been fortunate that we've been able to use it in most of our tricuspid procedures here. Um, and so that's where we, we find there's most value. Um, and so we tend to actually use it in, in every tricuspid intervention that, that we do here. Um, with that said, you know, limiting it to situations where T imaging is really tough, I think is a really practical way uh, to, to allocate those resources, especially in this day and age right now. I think in terms of what we foresee in the future, I think right now we haven't done procedures where we're using ICE alone. Could I see that happening in the future? I think absolutely, um, especially in situations where general anesthesia using prolonged TE may be a safety concern for an individual. I think that's a great avenue where, where 40 ICE can really help us uh, solve some of those solutions. Um, and then, you know, your second question about what's the balance between using, you know, all of these different imaging options and do we use them all in the same case? I think sort of time will tell. I mean, you have now great experience using that mini uh, T Pro probably more than most people in the world. Um, you and Laura, actually, both of you. And I think that that experience will help actually inform the community in terms of when when is this, you know, the probe to go to? Um, can we really replace a, a full-size TE probe with that? Um, I think that's something that, uh, I don't know, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it actually, uh, because that that's something that I think we're learning still. Maybe Laura, any comment from you? <laughs> No, regarding the, the mini TEA, I think that the, the images that we are getting are amazing and, and we start using it for interventions, but more from lefatral appendix occlusion. But the nice thing is that you can do it with the patient awake. But for the tricuspid, uh, sometimes it's tricky, the imaging. So you want to get the best imaging that you want, that you can get. So I think that for the moment, for me, it's better for tricuspid that it's in the far field, the standard uh, TEA than the mini, but I think that for the inter all the interventions that are really close to the left atrium, I think it's great because the imaging you have all the, the potential of the 3D and the image, it's very nice. But in the far field, 
as the tricuspid, it's difficult with the standard probe. So uh, you want everything when you are in the cath lab. So for the moment, we are sticking with the standard for the tricuspid. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I no, fully I... agree with you, Laura. I, I, yeah, we, we tried, I tried a lot of, of not, not a lot, but several cases, tried to get the perfect transgastric views with this micro T. And unfortunately, we are missing some contact. Uh, yeah. So so it's, I mean, for the tricuspid field, we, we are still learning a lot uh, every day. And probably all this technology is moving faster than us, <laughs> at least <Yeah>. fast. <laughs> so, so we need to, 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 perfectly do our analysis by standard TE first and then move to another technology for sure. So I really like your comments actually about that transgastric because one of the workflow you know, options that we've been toying with that we find can be quite helpful is using the ice to give us that sort of mid-esophageal, lower esophageal biplane grasping kind of imaging and then keeping our probe, our TE probe transgastric. So we have a very quick back and forth between a short axis and sort of grasping type views and also to minimize trauma to the esophagus and the uh, gastroesophageal junction. Um, so I think your point about the contact and really being able to optimize that transgastric with the TE probe is, is actually really important uh, for all of us imagers to consider um, moving forward. Um, very quickly, I just want to address a, a question that came up um, in the chat that's really great from uh, Carmen Garate Coloma, um, who is asking about who's responsible for the 4D ice. I think that's come up in a lot of meetings where, you know, there's been discussion about who steers the ice, who steers the, the console. And I think that's something that we're also learning right now. Um, I think that, you know, I've done both sides of it, fortunately, in terms of scrubbing in to manage the actual device itself, just like you'd handle a T-probe. And I've also done the, the actual, you know, panel side on the actual system. And I think one of the challenges with 4D ice is because you really have to manage it on the actual imaging console side, just like the way we do with, with 3D TE. I think that's where that, that sort of expertise and image optimization um, ends up relying a lot on, on an interventional imager. Um, so I think what we found, at least at our center, the most efficient workflow is to have the probe still in the hands of the interventional cardiologist or the structural surgeon, um, just because that part usually doesn't need too much manipulation once you find a good imaging window. Uh, but then there's a lot that needs to really happen on the software side of things, which can be uh, quite challenging. Um, and then, you know, before I, I move to sort of the, the key learnings and wrap up, I just want to see if there are any, you know, last comments from either of you uh, in terms of what we've discussed today and, and sort of some key take homes. Uh, maybe Laura, we'll start with you. Well, uh, just to say that it's uh, very interesting always when we participate in this kind of discussion, but because as Agustin was saying, we are still learning and every day and uh, every meeting, you change some of the, what you are doing routinely. So I think it's very interesting to have this interaction among people that is working in different centers and different countries because you learn a lot and in every place they make it different, but you can learn a lot in, in every meeting. Great, I totally agree with that. Augustine? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we are learning a lot and we need also to 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 enhance the communication with our cardiac surgeon and surgical cardiologist. I think uh, uh, Laura perfectly highlighted that screening is the key for all this uh, uh, TTVI. Uh, uh, but uh, of course, uh, we need to learn a lot and we're moving very, very fast and it's really interesting and it's re it was really nice to to talk with the, both of you all regarding this film. Yeah, thanks for that comment. I completely agree with that. I, I actually feel very lucky as well uh, that you know we get to be part of this evolving story. It's such an exciting field. Um, so it's very fun to be a part of this. So in the last uh, two minutes, I just want to wrap up and, and overview some of the key learnings. Um, you know, we spent a whole hour together, the time flew by. Um, so if we, you know, think back to the very beginning when Laura sort of took us through uh, the, uh, you know, all the screening uh, that we do from uh, an imaging point of view for the tricuspid valve. Um, we, of course, looked at what we look at for anatomy, severity, mechanism, and then how we potentially divide uh, select devices and actually plan our procedures. And then Augustine showed us a really great case 
uh, where he highlighted key working views and some of the special software tools that we can use when we're performing interventional procedural guidance. And then I think overall, uh, the three talks actually really brought in and showed us how at this point in time, TE and TTE, when we think about echo modalities, are really the primary uh, imaging intervention modalities. But of course, we still need more help uh, in some situations, and so there is still a complementary role of other things, CT, ICE, fusion, and there's a really, really bright uh, future ahead for all this, uh, the imaging in, in the tricuspid space. Um, so with that, to wrap up, I really want to thank uh, Laura and Augustine for joining us, Anna for managing our chat um, and the discussion there, uh, and all of you for joining us for this webinar. Uh, and please, uh, Join us in the future for future webinars, and hopefully you found this uh, educational and helpful. Bye, thank you. Bye.